Well, all the children want to come to the front. I've been waiting for like forever to say that. Beautiful. Oh, it's so good to see you children face to face. You've been seeing me maybe, but I haven't been seeing you, so it's great to be able to see you. Well, did you know we're looking at a passage today about being in a spiritual war? In a war. We're in a war right now, and we're in a war against the devil. And that can seem really scary. When we look at the passage today, it can be a little bit overwhelming, can be a little bit scary. But, you know, the thing we need to remember at all times in our Christian life is that Jesus loves us, is that Jesus is on our side and not on the enemy's side. And so I want to tell you a story about a man called Polycarp. A man called Polycarp. Polycarp, he was taught by a man called John. John wrote the, the book of the Bible called John. So Polycarp's very, very, very long time ago. He was just after the time of Jesus. And Mr. Polycarp was what we called a bishop. He was a leader of a church back then. And when he was 96, that's pretty old. Is anyone in the church 96? Yeah, no. Oh, just... Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Hawk. He feels it. <laughs> I didn't say it. Someone else said it. Um, okay, so he was 96 years old. He was real old. And one day, after 96 years of life, he got arrested. He didn't do anything naughty. He didn't do anything bad. He got arrested because he believed in Jesus. He got arrested because he loved Jesus and he followed Jesus. And so what they did with Polycarp is they brought him into a big arena. A big, imagine a big circle with seating around it. And, and they brought Polycarp in there and he stood in there and they said to him, Look, Mr. Polycarp, you're a very old man. And, you know, we don't really want to hurt a really old man because that doesn't feel very nice hurting old people. So... What about this? What about you just say you don't believe in Jesus? And if you say you don't believe in Jesus, then we can just let you go. That sounds like a good idea, eh? And so what do you think Mr. Polycarp said? Do you think he said, I don't believe in Jesus? No, it'd be a pretty bad story if he said he didn't believe in Jesus, wouldn't it? That's right. He said what? He did believe in Jesus. That's right, he did. He said to these people, he said, for 96 years, my Lord has never done me any wrong. For 96 years, my Jesus has always loved me, always looked after me, and always done what is right. Why should I stop loving him now? And they killed him. It's a bit of a sad story, isn't it? They killed him for it. But you know, he was right. Has Jesus never stopped loving him? And as he closed his eyes, he opened his eyes and looked upon the one he loved. He died. And the second he died, he looked into the face of Jesus whom he loved. And this is, this is the hope we have when we believe in Jesus. This is the hope you guys have. That no matter what happens to you in this life, no matter how scary your life can get, no matter how crazy things get in this world, Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. That's the hope we have. Let's pray and thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we do thank you that you love us. We thank you that you love these children. We pray that you'd help us to be brave. We pray that you'd help us to trust you in this war we pray that you'd help us to be like Polycarp and be willing to even die rather than say we don't love you and don't believe in you. We pray for these children. God, cause their faith to flourish. Help us as a church to gather around these little ones of yours and show them Jesus Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The book of Revelation, we're going to be turning to Revelation chapter 11. We're going to be looking at chapter 11 verse 19, which, ignoring the chapter divisions, begins this section. And we're going to read through to the end of chapter 13. 
And we're considering this morning what I've entitled the, un- the Unholy Trinity. So we often talk about the Holy Trinity. We're thinking about the Unholy Trinity this morning. So, Revelation chapter 11, <clears throat> beginning at verse 19. This is God's word for you this morning. Then God's temple in heaven was open, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, And on her head, a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now, war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it... The dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given it 
over and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation and all who dwell on earth will worship it everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain if anyone has an ear let him hear if anyone is to be taken captive to captivity he goes if anyone is to be slain with the sword with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So far, the reading of God's word, may he bless it to our souls, that we may be nourished and fed. Let's just come before the Lord in a time of prayer before we come to the preaching of his word. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we come before you as as hungry, hungry beggars wanting the bread of life. And so we pray this morning that you, would, that you would feed us. Lord, the book of Revelation to many of us is very confusing, very bizarre, and yet all very interesting. And so we pray that as we open up this passage that you would help us to see the truths that it contains. Lord, may, may we be filled with confidence in your word and the glory of Christ. May we behold the glory of the lamb that was slain. Bless us with your word. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, we often, we often talk about the persecuted church and the non-persecuted church. You know what I mean? So, so we refer to places like Asia and the church there as the persecuted church, and we refer to ourselves as the church at peace or the church which isn't persecuted. You know, this is really a false, a false dichotomy. If, so if you don't know what a dichotomy is, it's like when you have two ideas and you pit them against each other, or when you separate two things. Well, this, this is a false separation. It's a false distinction. And the reason it's false is that there's only one type of church. There's not two churches, one which is in hard times and one which is in easy times. You see, the only real dichotomy, the only real distinction is the church in the world. What did Jesus say? Jesus says, I have not come to bring peace. He said, you will be at enmity in the world. You will be at enmity with the world. He said, father will deliver child to be killed. Husband will deliver wife over to be killed for my name's sake. Blessed are the persecuted for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are, people, are you when people revile you and hate you for my name's sake, Jesus said. There is only two types of people. There is the church and there is the world. Unfortunately, we in the West, 
or some of us in the West, after centuries, centuries of peace, have tended to forget this, haven't we? Is it not so incredibly easy to forget that actually it's abnormal when we're not persecuted? Didn't Jesus say if, if, they, if they persecute me, how much more are they going to persecute you? Our expectation as believers in this world is that the world will hate us. The world will oppose us and the world will fight against us. But for, in a sense, millennia, the church has been enabled to just sort of exist. And, and over the last 100, 200 years, the church has made it its goal to become like the world. If we become like the world, then the world will like us and they'll want to join us. And so as we come to this passage, one of the, one of the stark contrasts is, is the realization and the recognition that we are at war. We must not be fooled into comfort, brothers and sisters. We must not be fooled into thinking we are at peace with the world. You know, like we, we, we feel bad for Asia. We feel bad for Africa. We feel bad for these other countries. But I'm really glad we don't have to face persecution and difficulty. We, I feel glad that we're at a time of peace. We're not at a time of peace, okay? We're not. We are at war. And the devil's greatest tactic in the last 500 years has been to cause the church to think it's not. To start thinking that the devil doesn't really do anything. The best thing he's ever done is cause people to forget about him and, and, and make him into a joke. You know, the little red devil with the pitchfork. It's all just a bit quaint and funny. And yet John wrote Revelation 12 and 13. John saw Revelation 12 and 13 not as a future vision of something which will one day happen. This is not a vision of something which will happen in 2072 when some special person rises up. The book of Revelation is written to every church for every age, for the application of now. That's the point of Revelation. The point of Revelation is we are facing and living in the end times now. The end times are between Christ's leaving and Christ's returning. This is why the same period of time gets used in every vision almost. You look through the passage. What do you see? You see 1260 days. At times, at times, and half a time, and you see 42 months. They're all the same period of time. And the point is, throughout the book, this is going on to every church. This is what you are facing in the world. And so we need to be, we need to be very aware of what we're facing. And so John begins by giving us that, that incredible picture of the woman, doesn't he? And, and he shows the, the coming of Christ. That's what it is, isn't it? The, the woman comes in the first section in chapter 12. The woman comes and she's in birth pains. And she's got 12 stars on her head, which represents the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. And she is the church of all ages. And she, out of this woman, comes the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who would rule, rule the nations with a rod of iron, it says in verse 5. And the devil, we see the devil, don't we? In, in verse 7 onwards, we see him there crouching and, and, and he's wanting to devour this child. He's wanting to destroy the child. Why? Think back to Genesis 3. 
Remember the prophecy of Genesis 3. Eve, you're going to give birth to a child, and, and the serpent is going to bite its heel, but, but the child, the offspring, is going to crush the serpent's head. And so this is the fulfillment of that. The devil's sitting there hoping to destroy. He's, this is the child. This is the child I have to destroy. And he's there seeking to destroy it. But God intervenes and protects the child. He whisks the child away. He delivers the child safely back to glory, having won the victory. But what does the devil do? The devil's cast down. What does the devil do? Does he, he sit back and go, oh, I'm defeated. Ah, oh, well, I might as well see myself out. No, of course not. What happens when you get an angry animal? And if you've ever worked with bulls, you, well, probably most of you haven't, but growing up working with animals, oh, I forget I'm in Auckland, um, living in the, the, on the farm, I can remember vividly one time we had this one bull which was just absolutely wild. And, and we managed to eventually get it into the pen and we eventually got the truck there ready and, and I'm sort of the gate person, always the worst job when dad says you're gateman, you know, terrible idea. But anyway, there am I on the gate and this bull decided it had enough. It clears a stock gate, which is huge, by the way, clears a stock gate, sort of damages its leg on the way out, which makes it really angry. And it sees one gate and little Logan standing on the other side. Guess what? The bull doesn't care very much how big Logan is. So it just comes straight for me, clean straight through the gate and just carries on going through about five fences. It was so infuriated. There's nothing we could do to stop it. And, and so picture now the devil. He knows he's defeated. But for a time, for a time, he is free on this earth. So what does he do? He makes war on the offspring of the woman, the text tells us. He makes war on the offspring of the children. You see, the devil isn't attacking us because he's hoping to win. Do you realize that? No, he's like a wounded wild animal just seeking to cause as much carnage as possible. In fact, there's an analogy in Hitler. I'm not sure if you realize this, but towards the loss for Hitler, right at the end, when you would think you'd be committing more resources towards the battle to try and win, do you know what he did? He committed more resources to try to kill off more Jews. He knew he was going to lose. And so I'm going to cause as much carnage as I possibly can. And so that's what the devil is doing right now. He's prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking to consume people and just do as much damage as he can. So how does he do it? Well, we see the dragon beast in verse 9. He fails. He, he comes to attack in verse 17, the offspring. The dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. And, and notice what he does. He goes to attack at the end of verse 17, and he stood on the sand of the sea. Very exciting, isn't it? Oh, very exciting. He just stands on the edge of the sea. The interesting thing is the dragon, we actually don't see him really do anything else in this whole passage. But he stands on the edge of the sea, and the implication is, the next verse, he calls out the beast. He calls out the, the first beast, the sea beast. And so out rises the sea beast. And, and notice what the sea beast has in verse, chapter 13, verse 1. It has ten horns and seven heads and ten diadems. And you're, if you've read Revelation, you'll remember right, right early on in chapter 4, you see this, this picture of the lamb who was slain. And he has seven horns and seven crowns, and he's robed in majesty and glory, and, and out rises this beast with ten horns and seven heads. He's crowned with majesty by the dragon. The dragon seeks to, to give him his own majesty, and he, he crowns him, and he raises him up in the earth. 
And this beast is covered in blasphemous names. And and he's an incredible thing to behold. And notice, notice what this beast does. It's very interesting. This beast in verse 4, they worshipped the dragon for he had given his authority to the beast and they worshipped the beast. What, what does the beast do? First and foremost, he directs worship to the devil, to his creator, to the one who called him out and to himself. Then he makes war on the saints in verse 7. He's allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. He's then given authority over all the nations. Then he blasphemes God in verse 6. And notice in verse 4, the, world's, the world loves it, doesn't it? And they worship the dragon. And notice what they say. Who is like the beast? And who can fight against it? I wonder if you've ever heard people in the world say to you, you you can't fight against the tide. You you can't. Just give in. It's too hard. It's too difficult. I wonder if you can remember the Old Testament passages which say, who, who is like the Lord? Who is like the Lord Almighty? The Lord strong and mighty for battle. And then the world is turning to the beast and saying, who, who is like the beast? But do you notice that the sea beast, the sea beast has a wound? Did you pick that up when we read through it? This the sea beast has a wound upon his head. It seemed to have, verse 3, a mortal wound, you know, a deadly wound. And yet it had been healed. Now I wonder if you're if you're connecting the dots here of what we're seeing. What is the devil doing? He's crafting something that looks and sounds a whole lot like who? Jesus. Jesus has the mortal wound. Hey, look at the sea beast. He's got a mortal wound. The the father, the father gives Jesus the authority on earth, doesn't he? He he sends the son down to do his work upon the earth and, and the devil. He calls the sea beast out and sends this sea beast out. And so John's painting this picture of the father and the son, but the unholy father and son version at work in this world, seeking to destroy the offspring of the woman. Who are the offspring of the woman? It's you. This is not some other people. This is you and me. And the devil is crafting an image of Christ replacement, a false Christ. And this is a continuous, ongoing reality. And the world loves it. And and it's everywhere. Honestly, it's everywhere. It's in the movies. It's in the books you read. It's in everything that the world will give you, in advertisements, in counseling systems, in psychology, in teaching programs, in preschool curriculums. It is everywhere. There is a constant undermining of the devil to seek to destroy the church. And we have to be aware because ignorance, ignorance will not do. If we are ignorant to the enemy's plans, we cannot stand up and fight. Can we? If you don't know you're at war, I mean, just imagine middle of World War II, and and, and you're sort of you're sitting in the middle of the battlefield. Someone says, What are you doing here? And you go, having a picnic, really? Don't you realize there's a war? Really? I did wonder what the really loud noises were. Oh, this is just a thunder, you know, that would just be madness, wouldn't it? But so often we can do that because we just get sucked in by the world. And we think the world's on our side. And so they come up with these brilliant counseling ideas for our foster kids. Oh, this would be really great for your kids. And I look at it and I'm like, wait a second, this is madness. There's nothing godly about this. 
you're effectively trying to brainwash my child. Oh, but it's all for their good. And gender ideology, it's all for everybody's good. And abortion, it's all for for convenience. Oh, we can't say that. It's all for the protection of the mother. Isn't this what they say? They're just sowing and sowing and sowing. And as the church, we get we get sucked into it. But then, then notice, notice this, this sea beast calls out another beast. The sea beast, verse 11, I saw another beast called the earth beast. The earth beast comes out. And of course, you know where this is going, don't you? You've got the father, you've got the son, and now the two of them send out the third person of the unholy trinity. And out comes this this unsanctified spirit that has two horns like a lamb. You notice that? It looks a whole lot like a lamb. The lamb is always the victory bearing Christ in in Revelation. The lamb that was slain is the conqueror. And here we have it's, it's a lamb, look, and it's got two horns. It looks just like a lamb. But notice its voice. It spoke like a dragon. And there's a really important point here for you and me. And that is that we can't trust our eyes in this world. Things, things so often in this world look good and safe, don't they? We, we can see books written by by Christians or so-called Christians, we can see speakers on YouTube. We can see things that look good and sound good. We think, oh, this all looks very good. It looks very Christianly. This advice by this counselor looks very good on paper. But the, the question we have to ask ourselves is, what do I hear? You see, the Word of God informs our ears. And we must learn to look with our ears. We see the lamb before us, but we hear the voice of the evil one. And doesn't that match up unbelievably well with they will come amongst you like wolves in sheep's clothing? It looks like a lamb. It looks like a sheep. It looks like the rest of us. But something sounds wrong. There is a tone of voice He or she, they don't sound like Jesus. They don't sound like what I'm used to hearing. And maybe you can't discern exactly why, but you just, do you hear it? And because you've informed your mind and heart and conscience by the word of God, you hear it and you go, this is not a lamb. This is not a sheep. This is a wolf. But look look what it does to point people towards the beast. Verse 12, it has authority given to it by the first beast. Isn't that what the Father and the Son do with the Spirit? They say, go, you've got my Spirit, Jesus says. You've got my Spirit. All authority I give to you. You're going to have my Spirit with all authority. Verse 12, it gives them authority in order to point people to the beast. It makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed, in case you missed it the first time. Then, verse 13, it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven. What does that remind us of? Old Testament, you remember? The the guys come up the mountain and Elijah's sitting on the mountain, or Elisha, I always get them too confused. They're sitting on the mountain and they say, come down. And he says, may fire consume you. Woof! And and then we remember the apostles. Hey, Jesus, should we call some fire down to consume them? Jesus says, what? Are you insane? That's my paraphrase, at least. And now we see this beast, fire, with sound effects. Yeah, that's right, with sound effects even. Blasting things. But it's not just signs in front of people. He works the signs in front of the beast and he creates an image of the beast and he breathes life 
into the beast. Isn't that what the Spirit does? He breathes life into us. And so the devil is the devil is creating a false god. That is the reality here. A unholy trinity, a false trinitarian god. And the question we have to ask, sorry, one last point which is great which I missed in my notes, is verse 16 and 17. See the other thing this spirit does, this evil spirit does. It puts a mark, and I'm sure we've all heard this so many times about the mark on the hand and people saying that it's going to be a microchip and a million other things. I'm sorry, I'm, it's, not, it's not coronavirus. I'm very sorry to inform you. And it's not going to be the immunization either. So I don't. you can decide if you get the immunization when it comes. But anyway, verse 16 and 17. Notice that they take a a mark on their hand or their forehead. Do you remember? Maybe, maybe you don't, but in the Old Testament it says, God says that he will write his name upon their hands. And what does the Spirit do in the New Testament? He seals us, doesn't he? He is a sealing mark that we are of God's. And here now this beast is a sealing mark of those who are not of God's. And the question we have to ask is, by what means, by what primary means does God, sorry, does the false God do all of this work? How does the unholy trinity primarily go about this work? And I want to suggest the clue is in verse 18. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now, if you had $100 for every time someone told you what 666 meant, you can probably retire early. Uh, it's been almost every political leader slash prime minister of America since America started. Um, do you notice that the way it's translated in the ESV, it says, this is the number of a man, you know, it would almost be better translated, this is man's number, as if it was the number the, the men owned, as opposed to the number placed upon them. And I think what John is alluding to is that the primary method by which he does this is through mankind. And, and there's two important points to realize there. Firstly, who do we battle against? What does Paul say? We do not battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. It, it's not that earthly people don't oppose us, but we recognize, like in the text here, that the enemy right now think Asia and think the emperor of China wiping out churches Think the, I can't remember his name, but the guy who is currently butchering people throughout Africa. They are human vessels that the devil is using to attempt to crush the church. And this, the other thing this means, if, if it's not flesh and blood, if it's not if it's not flesh and blood that I'm warring against, that if it's primarily the devil behind this person, what does that enable me to do? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What, what enables you when, when you're hanging on a cross? I mean, you think about these early Christians that this letter was written to. You're hanging upon a cross and seeking to do what Jesus did and say, Father, forgive them. Think about Jesus' words. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They're vessels. They're vessels who need the gospel. And they will seek to destroy you in your workplaces, in your bowling clubs, you know, we're in a bowling club, that's very fitting. In your families, in your neighborhoods, they will seek to make a train wreck of your life. Now, that doesn't mean every single human being in the world is going to oppose you. But you're going to expect 
that they're going to oppose you. And when they do, you're going to be able to say, Father, forgive them, because it's not really this person. It's, it's the evil one. And he's seeking to destroy you. He's seeking to destroy your church. Father, forgive them. But I don't know about you, but when you see this picture, isn't it all just a little bit overwhelming? I think, I mean, we're on, we're on this earth and there's this, the devil and he's created in a holy trinity and he's using governments and states and counselors and he's using school structures and he's using everything to seek to oppose the church. Who are we to fight against this? It just seems ridiculous. It seems unfair. Chapters 2 and 3, the churches are called to overcome and be conquerors. How are we meant to do that? Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will never overcome it. How? How is that possible? How is that possible? Have a look at chapter 12, verse 10. I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now! Now, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. How do, we, how do we deal with it all? What do we do? You notice that it says they have conquered him. It doesn't say they will. Isn't that interesting? Why, why does John say have? Why does he use what's called a perfect tense? Why does he use the, the past? What does he say they will? Wouldn't that make way more sense? John's thinking of now and into the future of Christians overcoming. Because John recognizes that in the midst of this whole war, the, the victory is already won. You see, th this, is, this is why Peter says the devil is prowling around like a lion, seeking those he might desire. He devour. He can't devour you if you've been an overcomer in Christ. You see, the, the point of this whole passage for John is he's, he's showing us the work of the devil so that we might flee to Christ. You see, the answer for our nation, the answer for our families, the answer for ourselves in our workplaces and everywhere is Christ. For he has overcome. And by the blood of the Lamb, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we flee to him and we conquer by the blood and we hold to our testimony even to the point of death. Are you prepared to die for the sake of Christ? Not just die physically, but die to yourself for the sake of Christ. Are you, are you ready to be pillaged with joy, as we're told in the New Testament, for the sake of Christ? Are you ready to lose your home? Are you ready for the government to say, we're taking every Christian's property because you won't agree with us? Are we ready for our school to be deleted from this property because we will not bow down to the idol of this world? Are we ready to have our churches burnt? Are we ready to stand up in the face of our work colleagues and be mocked? Are we ready to stand up to the dragon, the sea beast, and the earth beast for the sake of Jesus Christ? And in closing, let me ask you, how do we do that? What is the primary means by which we stand outside from the world and say, we will not join you. There's one word which runs through this chapter. Now, I'm not sure if you picked up on it, but it's the word worship. What, what, was, the, what was the thing that marked the world in its response to the beast? What did they do? 
They did the same thing that happened in Babylon when the statue was made. You remember that? The statue gets made in Babylon. What does everyone do when the music plays? They fall down in obeisance. They fall down and worship before the statue. And we see the exact same thing here. They make the image. They see beasts are there. And the world worships. Brothers and sisters, do you know what marks the church? Do you know what marks us as a community of God's people? It is worship. When we gather on a Sunday and worship, in spite of people's fear of coronavirus, in spite of many different things, when we come and worship and, and we refuse to go to the beach instead, when we say no to our sleep in and decide to come and worship, when we get to the evening and we could have a lamb roast, but instead we come to church and we worship, when we gather as God's people, we make the loudest shout in this world. You know the thing, the, the main thing that offends non-Christians about the church? It's that we will not buckle and we will continue worshiping God the way he tells us to. The thing that has killed the church in the West is its continual desire to change and bend for the sake of the world. We'll become more like the world. We'll change our worship. We'll change our style. We'll change everything so that the world likes us more. And we've killed our witness. But oh, when the, when the people of God will rise up in worship of the Lamb, when they will cast down their crowns, as we see in chapter 4 and 5, when they will do what we read in, verse, in chapter 14, when the 144,000 come together and there's harpists and singing and praise. And in chapter 15, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord? And glorify your name. Could you imagine us shouting that out at the top of our lungs and surrounded by unbelievers? Who would not fear you, Jesus? Because we're calling them a bunch of fools, aren't we? And they'll hate us for it. But oh, what a joy for us. Brothers and sisters, let me just exhort you. Worship God. Oh, my heart just rejoices seeing your faces here. Let us set aside everything. In the worship and praise of God, let us hobble ourselves in here as broken sinners, week in and week out, day and night, praising our God and King, for He is worthy of all honor, all glory, all praise, all power, all might, for He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are God. You are the true triune God, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God, we pray that you would, you would do a work in our hearts today. Do a work in our hearts that we might worship you. That we as a people and as individuals might be marked not not by external things, but by worship. That we might be worshippers of the triune God. Lord, protect us from the devil. But Lord, may your will be done. If our land needs to go to hell in a handbasket, would you do it with songs on our hearts? May we die before our song is stopped. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.